Good evening. Good really early morning if you're on the overseas in England and Germany, Switzerland. It'll be about like four o'clock in the morning for you guys. And I doubt that you'd be up this early to just listen to me. But I'm I'm uh, excited that you will be with us uh, in the recorded version of this. So I'm really excited about that. So welcome, everybody, to Rebooting Revelation. Let's have a word of prayer before we get into the word for tonight. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, God, that the Holy Spirit within us is the revealer and the teacher. God, we thank you that we are already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and you speak to us from that level and realm. And I thank you, God, that we have the capacity to see with our eyes hear with our ears, receive with our hearts, and think with the mind of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Rebooting Revelation. Let's pull back the curtain and see what's revealed. It's a study of the book of Revelation from a Christ-centered view. This is part 17, chapter 18, The False Church Has Fallen. Hopefully you've been keeping up with us. Uh, we've gone through... This will be part 17, 16 sessions like this already. Wow. And so if you're just coming in right now, I may say some things that you may think, how did he get there? Well, as the fellow who opened for us, Miles, just a little bit ago, uh, said that they're available online and it'll be a good idea to maybe go back and look at a few of those, especially class one, where we break down the language issue, uh, dealing with the Greek texts, as well as translation issues on how we're looking at some of this. I want to remind you also that the text we are using in English is called the Mirror Translation. I would highly recommend that you get that uh, Mirror Bible, the whole Bible if you can. It's great if you get the one, by the way, that's through the app, because as the p p publishing company updates their uh, text, you will get those updates for free. Uh, if you don't have that, or if you'd like the written copy, you can always get the full Mirror Bible online. Or if you just want the book of Revelation, we have a few copies left uh, of just the Revelation uh, segment. If you want, give us a holler and we'd be happy to help you get it. On that note, I want to remind you again, all these teachings are on YouTube uh, in the Master Giovanni uh, Ministries website, which is masteromen.com, as well as the to oasis.com website. They will be there for a season and then we'll be moving them to another platform, but you'll still be able to get at them at that time. So let's have a look at where we've been. We're going to review briefly our last session. In our last session, we called it the Scarlet Harlot and the Beast. It became necessary for us to once again discuss what the a false Christ or a counterfeit lamb looks like. So I'm going to put up this slide, which if you think about it, we've repeated this probably three or four times through this entire Revelation series, but it bears repeating again because it's so easy because it's almost like when, when we walk out the doors, there's an, another mindset that tries to almost assault us at times. And that's this. So it's important to remind ourselves that the seven ecclesias mentioned in the first two chapters of Revelation, we call them commonly the seven churches, but rather than use the word church using ecclesia, meaning it's, it's, a, it's a preposition and a verb that describes one coming out of a certain mindset. Those seven churches are then redefined from chapter four all the way to the end, really. And where we are right now is uh, in chapter uh, 18 is the church of Thyatira and how it's going through what it's going through as we are now seeing in very theatrical ways some of the things that are happening. The counterfeit lamb, let's define that. Counterfeit lamb, some may call it antichrist, some may call it pseudo Christos or pseudo Christ, but most importantly, it's false. The counterfeit lamb is a version of a dying and rising God who paid for the sins of people, to stop the wrath of his supreme God and or father. This is the pagan principle of penal substitution, also known as vicarious atonement. 
Now, I say that because the concept of dying and rising gods are nothing new. They go back to Babylon, and even before then, they reappear many, many times, and there is a Christ-like message within them, but the whole reason for the things that go on around them, the type of sacrifices, were penal substitution and vicarious atonement. You say, what is that? You're going to have to go back a few classes. If I reteach that now, we'll be here for another extra half hour, I'm sure. I do want to remind you, though, vicarious atonement, the word atonement, is not used properly. It was right around the same time of Martin Luther. I think I got my little dyslexic here. It's not 1852. It's something like 1528 or something right around there. The Tyndale, Tyndale version first came out. Atonement was used differently for the first time. The Father and Supreme God is depicted as shamed because of sin and wrathful as a result, demanding payment for sins because of some Olympian type justice that must be gratified. This is not forgiveness. This is payment. You're going to see that more in the lesson today. The merging of the gospel of grace with penal substitution, when we try to do that, we, are, we redefine grace. And it transforms the truth of Christ into a lie and presents a false Christ or a counterfeit lamb who gives place to the harlot of Babylon, which is a false church. It's kind of like preaching one message, but having a Jesus T-shirt on. Which is the point of, of talking a couple of chapters ago when he describes a lamb that looks like it was dead and rose again, but it spoke as a dragon. There's no different than me ascribing these kinds of doctrines, penal substitution or vicarious atonement, and wearing a Jesus t-shirt and saying this is what Jesus teaches. Right. No different. Again, it transforms the truth of Christ into a lie and presents a false Christ who gives place to the harlot of Babylon, a false church, and the political systems she sleeps with. If you remember last week, we talked a bit about that in depth, but the whole notion is there's a propensity of this type of church to merge itself with a political system of the day. We saw that with Caiaphas and Herod, for example, uh, in the time of Jesus. And we have seen it, we're not going to reteach all that, but we've seen it time and time again right up to this present day. Which brings us now to the next point was there is a spiritual pattern that appears throughout the Old Testament that the writer of Revelation addresses as something both the apostles warned us of as well. So Revelation, the writer of Revelation, John is addressing it as well as the other apostles, particularly Paul in the book of Acts, for example, warns us of. And this is kind of the, the process. Don't make a religious rule out of it. But in general, you'll see this thing happening. The authentic occurs from God through people. We call it a move of God or something. Something happens, authentic. But then a counterfeit emerges, and many times from the same people, but usually the second generation, for example. Because rather than experiencing that fresh revelation, many times we're passing on now a tradition that was life to one, but not as much life to the other. Don't take that as a rule that just because it's... Maybe you're in a second generation of a church movement that all of a sudden now, oh my God, am I a counterfeit? Don't, don't, that's fear. That's not what I'm trying to say. We're just talking about patterns that you see through the old. Why do you think the children of Israel had this move? And then all of, have of God and things will go great. And then all of a sudden they're back in bondage and then they come out again and then they go back again and then they come out. I mean, on the average, like every 450 years, the cycle went over for the children of Israel. And it's no different for us because this is what the apostles warned us of. Okay, then a counterfeit emerges and many times from the same people, by, usually by the second generation, replaces the authentic with religiosity. Then there's a remnant awakening. Sometimes a, calam a calamity of some kind can be a catalyst. Then the authentic reemerges. Many times it's persecuted by the counterfeit. The emergence can be just another phase of spiritual development or it can be final, uh, the final form uh, of the authentic. So in other words, we have the authentic thing that happens. And then from the authenticity, it begins to morph into, which is, I've, I am literally just rehashing the first two chapters of Revelation by saying this. It then emerges back into works or back into some kind of religious system, though carrying all the correct, uh, if you want to use that term, correct terms and the correct 
theological statements, but it no longer has the same vibrancy. So it now becomes something else. Then from that, a remnant awakens to, to, wait a minute, how did we get here? And that doesn't happen, and I say remnant, because remnant means a small group. Many times this stuff happened with a small group of people over a period of time. I'll give you one little fast history thing, for example. Azusa Street Revival as we know it, for those of you who study. You have to realize 25 years before Azusa Street, I think the fellow's name was Charles Parham, mm -hmm. was teaching about the baptism coming and the outpouring of the Spirit 25 years earlier without a manifestation. So in other words, an awakening started to happen, but it took a while before we saw things occur. And just because that baptism of the Spirit happened and people spoke in tongues and healing stuff, then what happened? It, it went sideways and turned into something else. I mean, it's just, I'll give you the secret. I'm gonna go way to the end of this lesson and give you the secret, the secret I perceive that Jesus tells us about, that the apostles tell us about to keep us from going into counterfeit and remain in the authentic. And that's simply this, humility, a humble, loving heart. With the understanding of what the harlot of Babylon is and recognizing the status of a counterfeit Christ, we recognize that when Christendom, just to reiterate, I use the phrase Christendom to try to dis differentiate from the authentic Christianity. Sound okay? Christendom would be the religious Christianity. It doesn't matter what flavor it is. Pentecostal, go down the list, you know, fundamentalist. I don't care. We all can fall into that category very easily, and many of us have, myself included. Okay? We recognize that when Christendom is in a direct relationship with a political agenda and government, we have Jezebel, who is teaching her people to commit fornication. Now, I say that because that's Thyatira. That's Jezebel right there. Okay, and, and, and it's ta it talks about how she taught her people to commit fornication. Mind you, we're now talking about the harlot of Babylon, also called the prostitute. Okay, same thing. Now, to commit fornication, if you... It's interesting, we've also redefined that word, fornication, by the way. The Greek word fornication doesn't mean premarital sex or sex outside of marriage. It means to purchase sex for money or for a favor. That's really what it means. Okay? So the point is, is it really brings about a definition here because what this church harlot of Babylon Jezebel is doing is selling herself in exchange for something. Make sense? Okay. G King Jesus, and I use that phrase that way. I didn't say Jesus. I didn't say Christ. I said King Jesus. Defining political authority. King Jesus made it clear on how his kingdom, which is not of this world, how it is actually to interact with the governments of this world. I mean, he's not silly saying, well, you know, don't have anything to do with them because, you know, you know, you're kind of in this world, but not of it. Well, you are in this world and yes, not of it. And yes, his kingdom is not of this world. So the, 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 if the spiritual life principles that one would emanate doesn't come from any political system here. Okay, but Jesus is clear. Render, therefore, to Caesar the thing that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And he, that's repeated three times, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He's very clear. Jesus doesn't have problems with the Caesars, if you will. I mean, he, we can argue about, you know, well, he, he, there's some that are worse than others, and this one may do better than others. But after a while, that's still that tree knowledge of good and evil system. Jesus is not coming from there. He's just being clear. Give the Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. 
The challenge is, which we talked about, the problem arises when we start giving to Caesar what is God's and start attributing to God what is from the seat of Caesar. Now we got a harlot. In Revelation 17, 6, we read, The woman I saw was intoxicated with the blood of the saints and the blood of those who bore the testimony of Jesus. The notion of drinking the blood of the saints isn't a secular world killing holy people, much less taking away religious rights. When Jesus said, now I didn't share this in the last lesson, so I'm bringing it in right now to, to, to kind of uh, embellish a bit on what we talked about last time. When Jesus said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood, John 6, 53, he was clear that he wasn't talking about physically eating or drinking anything. But it was a metaphor congruent with a Hebraic mindset, quote, this is now just 10 verses later, it is the spirit who gives life, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. He defines for us, he's not talking about, and you know, from a historical standpoint, because of some of this teaching, one of the reasons why in certain places in Rome, Christians were persecuted is because they actually thought we were eating flesh and drinking blood. They didn't understand what was going on. So we, they thought we were the flesh eaters. That's crazy nuts. But think how they felt, like, man, this new religion in town, they're drinking blood and eating, you know. Thank God there wasn't cable news network. God knows how this would have went. Or would have gone, proper English. <clears throat> You're welcome, dear. This scarlet, blood red harlot is actually consuming the mindsets of the saints into her way of thinking and believing regarding their relationship with God and Caesar. A key to this harlot church is about coming against evil in the name of good, which is still the serpentine tree that causes death in every manner. The kingdom of Christ exists in a significant higher dimension. Wherefore, the blessing of humanity, the knowledge of good and evil, is not a qualifier. Matthew 5, 44 through 45. We read this again last time. But I say to you, love your enemies. No. <laughs> Bless those who curse you. Do good to those that hate you. No. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That's very different than, to say, the situation we're in right now. Not just in America, but across the world. The things people are saying and doing each other in the name of Jesus, mind right. you. Right. Because I'm a Christian, I got to stop those people. Right. Yep. That you may be sons of your father in heaven. Now, he's really redefining father, which we're going to uh, tackle a little later. He's redefining the father, at least from the religious mindset at his time, and says, and which really is redefining the father and the religious mindsets of a lot of us now that you may be the sons of your father in heaven, for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. The father is not looking at who's good and evil. He doesn't operate out of that system. Thank God he doesn't have an ego like some of us do. He doesn't operate out of that system. Instead, he operates from a life-giving system, and whether we're evil, good, just or unjust, he's going to give us the necessary aspects of what produces life. The lamb triumphed, if you remember, over the harlot and the beast through the political system's recognition of the legalistic condemning ways of Christendom, and they revolted. Right? The political systems revolted against the harlot. That's where we started coming to an end in chapter 17. Mind you, this is, there is no other metaphor here but the harlot being the harlot of Babylon slash Christendom. Revelation 17, 6. The beast and the ten horns you saw 
will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire, NIV. My gosh. The Aramaic, we read this, rendered the following verse, which comes right after that, this way. For God granted in their hearts that they will do his desire. The way this verse reads is that God gave the political systems the desire to turn on the harlot. Another way to word this would be this, as we unpack it further, if you really look back into some of the political elements of what was here, is they had the desire to destroy her, destroy her really from the beginning unless they profited from the relationship. Okay? Think of that young woman in Acts 16. These are the men that show the way of salvation. That was fine because the magistrates were profiting from her. Soon as Paul took care of that spiritual situation and she stopped, then they were all upset. Okay. So they had the desire to destroy her unless they profited from the relationship, but God no longer prevented them from fulfilling what was in them. He gave them their desire. Why? Why prevent the harlot's destruction for a time? So glad you asked. <laughs> Which brings us now to tonight. Chapter 18. With this, I saw another celestial messenger descending out of the heavenly sphere with blazing light beaming out of him. The, the light lit up the earth with the brightness of his glorious presence. He announced in a thunderous voice, the great Babylon is utterly crushed. It has become a ghost town of demons, haunted by every unclean spirit, held in it like in a cage of eerie, spooky birds. The masses of mankind became intoxicated with the wine of her passion and adultery, while the kings flirted with her, and the traveling traders of the world made their wealth with the powerful lure of her attractions. And I heard another voice saying out of the heavens, come on out of the grasp of her deception. You are my people. You have nothing in common with her distortions and need not participate in her plagues. Her perverted twistedness of God's image in you has piled up and polluted every square inch of earth and sky. In the death and resurrection of the slain lamb, God confronted every remembrance of the unrighteousness she represents. The lamb's suffering dealt a double blow to the whore and beast system. The counterfeit cup she had mixed turned on her and proved to be her defeat. This is a complete reversal of her self-inflated glory and luxurious lifestyle to the exposure of her falsehood, like when metal is tested with a touchstone. And to be fool's gold, and gladness is turned into sorrow. You said in your heart, I am established as a queen and not a widow. I will not know grief. Her calamity strikes in one day, death, sorrow, and starvation. Her entire dynasty is burnt to ashes in the fire of the passionate judgment of the Lord God. And the kings of the earth, the executives of the mindsets of the beastly system, her faithful fornicating friends and clients are weeping and wailing bitterly while the smoke of her burning rises. They stand completely detached from her, embarrassed by their association with her in her exposed, pretentious identity, crying, Alas, alas, the mighty city of Babylon is doomed in one hour. Also, the money power emperors of the world who control the global trade routes, the merchants and economists are wailing and mourning because the judgment on her caused the loss of all their clients. No one buys their cargo anymore. The touchstone currency of God has exposed the fake currency system of the world economy. Suddenly, no one shows any interest in their most precious cargo of gold, silver, rare gems, pearls, fine linen fabrics, purple, silk, scarlet, all kinds of scented wood, ivory carvings and articles, expensive hardwoods, bronze, iron, and marble. The list goes on and on. Cinnamon. Spices, incense, perfume, frankincense, wine, 
olive oil, flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, wagons, and slaves. No buyers. The entire economy crashed. None of the sought-after seasonal fruits or any delicacy associated with their luxurious living were available any longer. Not even a trace of these could be found. The once mighty merchants and money brokers who gleaned their wealth from her were standing afar off, afraid and disoriented. They weep and wail bitterly since the touchstone currency of their economy has been exposed as fake. Alas, the great model city of the world is doomed dressed to perfection in the most expensive and elegant fashion, draped in purple and scarlet fabric, festooned and sprinkled with golden glitter and ornaments. She was elaborately decorated with gold, precious stones, and pearls. In a brief moment, all this pomp had come to nothing. The great shipping tycoons of the world, their workforce and clients all stood in bewilderment, witnessing from afar the ruin of their entire enterprise as it went up in smoke. They wept bitterly in lament. Who would have thought that this great city of unequaled prominence could come to nothing? In their sense of hopelessness and bafflement, they cast dust upon their heads as if to wrap their minds around the ultimate reduction of their vibrant life to lifeless dust. They are weeping and wailing in shock for the great city which has fallen. Oh, what a shame the famous icon of prosperity who made every ship owner rich is now left utterly desolate in just one hour. And deep sense of relief is felt in the heavens as all the saints, the apostles, and the prophets celebrate how God caused the whore's judgment of others to be her own judgment. And a huge celestial messenger lifted what seemed like a massive millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, So shall Babylon, the great prostitute city, be hurled into the ocean, and not a single trace of her existence shall ever be found again. Never again will the festive sound of harpists, singers, flautists, and trumpeters be heard in you. Not even a trace of any art or creative skills and crafts will remind of days gone by. The familiar grinding sound of the millstones will be silent forever. Not even a hint of a candlelight or any lamp will ever bear testimony to your forgotten nightlife again. The voice of the bridegroom and bride will forever be silent in you. Her merchants were the great untouchable tycoons of the world who seduced all the nations with her pharmaceutical potions and spells. The blood of the prophets and the saints and very one slaughtered in the scapegoat sacrificial system of the world order were evidenced in her. Whew. Reminiscent of Genesis chapter 1, we have a bright light heralding the message that darkness is dispelled. There's an interesting phrase in Revelation 18, 2, which says, The great Babylon is utterly crushed. It has become a ghost a ghost town of demons haunted by every unclean spirit, held in it like a cage for eerie, spooky birds. By the way, what you're watching is an actual, real supernova um, exploding. And I just thought to give us a little, little science with this, you know. The other thing, too, I couldn't help but think when I was reading about the ships and losing their, their business, I couldn't help but think of the ships on the coast not going anywhere right now. <laughs> yeah. Well, how has religion become the harbor prison or cage for demons? That's what it said, right? That this false church, this, this church of Christendom has become the cage in which demons live. How does that happen? You know, because we've been trained with theology like, well, a Christian can't be demon possessed. <laughs> okay. They, demons really don't need to. If you believe in that kind of thing is how demons work, they don't really need to. All you need is an ego and you're already swapping spit with them. <laughs> Let's be honest. 
It's this bright light that dispels this cage and proclaims that it has been crushed. Again, like God speaking, light be, way back in Genesis 1-3. In 2 Corinthians 4, however, there's a, a great segment that I think bears looking at as we begin to unpack what's happening here in Revelation 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 2 through 6, this is just the NIV. It says, rather, Paul speaking, rather we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we recommend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So we're talking about distorting God's word, which is what we just came from in discussing the harlot. He says, to the contrary, we speak the truth plainly. Verse 3, and even if highlighted, if our gospel is veiled. Now you do understand, based on the chapter before, where he's speaking about the temple, the veil of the temple that prevents us from seeing and accessing God's presence. If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Who's doing the veiling here? When we distort the word of God, or we use some form of deception or manipulation, right? Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. And then he says, the God of this age has blinded the minds. So now, which is totally goes right to what the veil is all about, right? With the, the cherubim on it and all that sort of stuff that, that is, is part of that aspect. But the point is, the God of this age has blinded the minds if our gospel is veiled. So who's doing the veiling? Who's blinding it? It's when we as Christians have distorted something that start to veil the message. And Paul begins to unpack what that is. Watch. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. We're now back to image and likeness. But where is it? Where is this glory of God? The glory of Christ. This glorious gospel. Verse 5, for we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let, here it goes right, right back to Genesis 1 again, let light shine out of darkness made his light to shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. The image and likeness right here. If this message somehow veils the reality of Christ in you, and I don't just mean my belief in it, but my perceiving of it, where I live and emanate from that space, that's what we're talking about here. In other words, a gospel that speaks of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is a gospel that's veiled the message of the image of God. Because what destroyed, if you will, in our thinking, the image of God was our belief that I had to partake of this tree of right and wrong in order to become better. The message hasn't changed. A gospel that veils the message of the image of God living within our hearts, which is the light. This is the God of this world. The egoistic serpent with its religious systems that empowers principalities and powers and demonic forces in our lives. Understand something, the greatest empowerment of sin, which is a distorted view of our identity, doesn't come from a fabricated world system, which we call the enemy. And definitely not because of immorality. Rather, it's the legalistic presence of moralism in any religious form that empowers the darkness and veils the true message. 
This is why the harlot church is the cage of demons. She empowers them with that counterfeit Christ teaching. Let me show you further. Colossians 2, 13 through 15. What did the cross of Christ do? What did the light do? We're going to read this, but I want to highlight some things as we go. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, in other words, you still live by a solely egoistic drive. God made you alive with Christ. You didn't make yourself alive. God made you alive. Amen. Why does that matter? Because my ego can't be involved then. I can't pat myself on the back and say, see, well, I did it right. That's why I got Jesus now, you know. <laughs> In the same way that Jesus had to humble himself for us to be like Jesus, actually really reveals Jesus because the curtain's here. <laughs> He's in there. But remember, where's the veil? Where's the blindness, right? right? Humility, that's what I said earlier, is what breaks that. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations. Notice the forgiveness issue here. He didn't say this, as we have taught sometimes. He forgave us all our sins, having paid. It said he canceled. Right. Having canceled the written code with its regulations, that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. This is why legalism and law to even operate out of a good and evil, right and wrong mindset is, is literally defying the fact that the written code's been nailed. Yeah, but what about those people? It's nailed for them too. Amen. Whether they know it or not, doesn't matter. It's how I approach it. Because ultimately, I don't care how many, how, how many folks it is, I don't care what's going on in the world, the only person really that you can transform, of course, we talk about transforming others and preaching the gospel, it's got to start here with us. There's really nobody else that really that I can be totally responsible for. So having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us, he took it away, nailing it to the cross and watch and having disarmed the powers and authorities, King James says, principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. He disarmed them. If demonic forces are empowered, that's because there's legalism present somewhere. Well, there's devils running all over the nation. Get rid of the legalism in the church, guess we'll be disarmed. But if I'm the cage... If I'm part of the harlot thinking and I'm preaching good and evil, right and wrong, and this is wrong, and that's the devil over there, and I got to do this, and I got to pull this down and did damn this. And, you know, of course, we will not say damn, but might as well, right? We, all that, right? I come against that. What are we doing? I'm giving it power. Watch. Romans 7, 8 through 10. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of covetous desire. For apart from law, sin is dead. What? But if it, and he says earlier, you know, but if, if the law didn't talk about evil desire, I wouldn't know I had one. He, that the law in its own self is just and, just and good? I mean, conceptually, okay, that, fine. 
Thou shalt not kill. Fine. But the very fact that's out there, watch people on the freeway. There's a whole thing we can get into that because I'm convinced more and more as long as the soul of a person, this comes from a whole different aspect of teaching about living in a body and all that stuff. We can do it another time, but I'm just going to throw it out there. The more you encase the soul in the physical form, the more egoistic it becomes. Put a person in a car and you're in traffic and somebody cuts you off. How many times you get into sign language and other metaphors because they really, maybe they can't exactly hear you, but you don't care. But sometimes, I mean, it happened to me on the way here. Somebody just honked his horn because I was going too slow when I was going to make a turn. And like that. Now, if we were out, not in the car, not as protected as in the body, right? Now, guess what? And somebody, but by accident, bump into you on the street, would you be like, eh, to that person? Nine, nine times out of ten, you'd be like, oh, no, I'm, it's okay, no, no problem. Yeah, put us in the car. <laughs> but sin seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment produced in me every kind of covetous desire. From apart from law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from law, but when the commandment came, sin sprang to life and I died. Ouch. I found that the very commandment that was intended to bring life actually brought death. Can we get that? Can we, yeah, I was going to say, you know, can we get that through our heads? You, you can't. It has to come through a place of humility where awareness comes on where you operate from. When you're aware that the angers are there, the frustrations, the covets, and I can always think of covetousness, most people think, oh, he's talking about sex. No. Any more than I'm talking about getting hungry. Sex and hungry are like the same thing, you know? We just yeah. got to restrain ourselves in different ways sometimes. OK, not talking about that. That's that's too easy. We look at that stuff and all of a sudden that becomes the wrong. I become right. I didn't do that because so I didn't do that. That makes me more righteous than them. No, we're talking this, this is really where the rubber meets the road now. Because that's if anything, that's lightweight. If not, if, if anything, you'll see in a minute, it means kind of a whole lot of nothing. For apart from the law, sin is dead. So the purpose of that Colossians thing is Jesus nailing the written code to the cross. Okay, so now the legalism's gone. So what's left is for me to reconcile the egoism, serpentine egoism in my life in contrast to the altruistic humility of Christ. But as long as law is present, I can't do that. Because what I'll wind up do is doing is seeking to be right. In my eyes and God's eyes, and we all know that when we're right, God agrees with us. <laughs> Let me give you how irrational this becomes. Now, I'm going to ask you to listen with a humble heart because this could be fiery, a fiery thing for some folks. I have a friend who leads a ministry. Intentionally, I'm being vague. Just in case you'd know who that person is, you know, or that ministry is, my, my goal is not to, and actually my friend wasn't the problem, but I, I, I'm, I'm not into, it's not about the name calling as much as it is if you can grasp the principles, then when we hear the principles happen in other places, in other ways, it's not so much about the person, but about where this is coming from. So I have a friend who leads a ministry who had a person speak that made the following comment in reference to a political person in an opposing political party who was pro-choice, which to them means pro-abortion. She mentioned the name of the politician. This is speaking from the pulpit. And then said, quote, anyone who kills babies cannot be right with God, end quote. Now let that settle for a minute. Now, first of all, 
the religious spirit of Christendom, the harlot, who takes a literalist view, feels really good about that condemning statement and, and will embrace such thing in the name of a righteous cause. So when I heard this, I responded to my friend who was concerned and pondering how to respond to this person's comment. I said, well, you know what? That's so good to know. So I won't check the box for anyone who is pro-choice because you can't be right with God if you kill babies. But if I'm a biblical literist, I evidently can be right with God and even a man after God's own heart. If I have a sexual relationship with my neighbor who's married, after I was looking through her window at her bathing, get her pregnant, then send for her husband who may work at the same company I work for and give him a few days off to spend intimate time with the wife to cover up the pregnancy. Then when he refuses and says he really needs to work on an important project, I send him to a very dangerous part of the job knowing that it would result in an accident and kill him. Again, to cover up what his wife and I did and the pregnancy. Then, as hoped, he's killed on the job. And I think we're out of the jam. But then a prophet friend comes and he tells me of my situation, but in a metaphor. So I get upset because I'm a dedicated religious righteous man. Until my friend points out, oh, the guy he's talking about is me. <laughs> Consider, I didn't lose my job over it. I wasn't struck ill by God over it. And the woman I had uh, the affair with isn't struck either. Rather, you know who's struck by God? Let me read it to you out of 2 Samuel 12, 15 through 18. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David it, it became ill, and on the seventh day, it died. Well, evidently, God ain't right with God. <clears throat> David even pleaded with God for the child's life. I guess he was pro-life. But evidently, God wasn't listening because he was more interested in killing the baby to save his name. 2 Samuel 12, 14 tells us that the reason why the baby had to die was because it would have looked bad on the nation. Read your Bible. You're going to be a literalist telling me about this is wrong, that's wrong, and that's why we need to stand, and this is my party, and that's what I'm doing. Read your Bible first. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, maybe you should, as I like to jokingly say, step away from the Bible before you hurt yourself and somebody else. I mean, think about it. Talk about injustice, which is why Jesus had to bring the Father to us in a different light, because this don't make any sense. Why in the world would the person who dies is the innocent of the group? David not dead, woman not dead, baby dead. This is how religion thinks. Well, you got people preaching things like, well, People, people who kill babies can't be right with God, then you gotta, you're a literalist because you're going to take the Bible literally and you're going to point out a verse on why that's the case. But nicely skip over this one where God kills a baby who was innocent and even though it's a product of not even rape. And you really want to complicate it? God didn't kill it in the womb. He waited till the thing was on the outside. I mean, how many of us could 
could we're upset if it's third trimester. We're upset if it's middle trimester. Now in certain places, we're upset if it's after six weeks. Right. <laughs> God waited till the baby was born and a few days later get it sick, then kills it. Right. Oh, wow. Or at least that's the God we're led to believe yeah. that's here. Right. But I'm going to use my Old Testament scriptures like Jeremiah, I formed you in the womb and I knew you and that's why we shouldn't kill babies. And then God evidently didn't read his own. Well, maybe that prophecy didn't happen yet in Jeremiah because Jeremiah comes later. So God was unaware of that. You know, I mean, if you see it, my point is, is after a while, you put your mind into a mental gymnastics trying to reconcile this stuff. And, you know, and the, the, the easy religious answer, something Jesus never did was, well, you don't know God. I mean, God has the right to judge. So he got the right to kill babies, but you don't. Even though Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And then said, all that I do, you can do. And greater. <laughs> Revelation 18, 4 through 5. And I heard another voice saying out of the heavens, come out of the grasp of her deception. Herein is the point of what the writer of Revelation is telling us. First, from the last lesson, we found God withholding or holding off the violence of the political leaders from the harlot. And we said, why? That's why we ended. Why? Why was he holding it off? Because his people were wrapped up into it. His people were part of this harlot church. And to be honest, it was his people that created the Harlot Church. It wasn't something else outside of that. Go back and read Revelation 2 and 3. We created this. This is our doing. God is trying to rescue his revelation of the gospel in people from the mindset of the counterfeit lamb and the serpent of the tree, the beast. Yet, God confronts the mindset of such political religiosity that the harlot represents through the lamb's death and resurrection. Let's continue to read. God is saying to come out or come on out. I was thinking King James for a minute. says the same thing. Come on out of the grasp of her deception. You are my people. You have nothing in common with her distortions and need not participate in her plagues. It's interesting the way that's worded in the text, too, because it can, can sound like the plagues that are going to come on her or the plagues she dishes out. It's kind of an interesting idea. Her perverted twistedness of God's image in you has piled up, polluted every square inch of earth and sky. In the death and resurrection of the slain lamb, God confronted every remembrance of the unrighteousness she represents. Now, we think of unrighteousness as a moral thing. Unrighteousness, by definition, if you go back and read Romans 1, for example, especially in the mirror, okay, or some of the other more recent translations, you're going to find unrighteousness means not allowing the gospel of grace to stay pure. It's got nothing to do with Gay marriage, nothing to do with pro-choice or not. I mean, I mean, we would have, we've had a, you would call our church in a, in a mess because we have people that are pro-life and pro-choice here, right. coexisting, right. maybe even like each other a little bit. <laughs> because when we reduce when we would reduce those things down to a very simplistic point and toss a, toss away the rest of the Bible, more importantly, our relationship with Christ because we think our relationship with Christ is only through Bible verses. If that was the case, the first 300 years of the church was in trouble. That's another message for another day. The lamb suffering dealt a double blow to the whore and beast system. The counterfeit cup she had mixed turned on her and proved to be her defeat. Legalism, that thing will always come back to you in some way. I by no means walk on water in the sense of any moral perfection here. 
But how many times have we witnessed where, quote, moralists preach against something and especially point the fingers at somebody's flaw? I'm not talking about preaching harlot stuff. I'm talking about flaw. And even then, that's why I haven't mentioned anybody's names here from the pulpit, although maybe, again, because my view is the preacher, if you will, that preaches harlotry. Boy, that's hard way to, harsh to say it, but let's call it what it is. The preacher preaches harlotry, and the preacher who commits adultery and has a moral failure deserve the same mercy and grace. <laughs> the only challenge is, one, actually, one is more deceptive than the other. I mean, most of us can figure out, well, you know, he probably shouldn't have done that with that lady. I mean, Bathsheba, really? I mean, you know, that was really complicated. Did you realize Bathsheba's grandfather was the counselor of David? Oh, I mean, that was messy. It was church. It gets messy when this stuff happens. But as long as we approach it from the legal, legalistic standpoint, I'm, I'm not saying what was right or wrong here. I'm talking about what does life look like? What is injecting life like into any of those situations? First of all, it begins by not compartmentalizing. One of the challenges we've had with the authority teaching in the church about the authority of the pastor, the authority of the apostle, and some of the authority stuff, is really we gave them the right to decree right and wrong things. And we relished it. And you can add the evangelist and the prophet. No. They were, if you read Ephesians 5, they are the ones that is supposed to bring us life to the point we build up the body. The beauty about the life of Christ and what he represented was that he didn't give you a set of morals to hopefully obtain God likeness, and he didn't give you a set of morals to hopefully shun satanic attack. What he did was to say, we're going to walk together, and there's nothing. Get it out of your mind, because it's, it's pinned to the cross. There's nothing you can think about right or wrong, good and evil, that's going to take my presence from your side. Amen. Nothing. God confronts the mindset of such political re religiosity she represents through the Lamb's death and resurrection. The lamb is about grace upon all, regardless of where anyone is in their understanding. Because here's a nice little catchphrase religion likes to throw at, throw at us. It's called greasy grace. Can't, in other words, I got to put a little law in there just to balance it out. And then I call it balancing it with truth, meaning I balance it with law. When truth means actually to uncover the revelation of Christ. The gospel is about releasing the revelatory power of God within us. It's not about a moralistic system, which is very difficult on the serpentine ego to accept. The only time we tend to face such things is when either in our religiosity we've fallen and the offender of our legalism is us, which then can plunge us into depression because we failed. Or, worse, in that same mindset, we do as Adam with Eve and justify our behavior, pointing blame and guilt. Well, the woman you gave me, her fault, she the one. I mean, if you didn't give me to her, I wouldn't eat the apple. The suffering little lamb, who is now king of all, portrayed how victory is won. Jesus died because of our violent sinfulness. 
He didn't die because of a violent, wrathful father. Jesus died. Somebody just asked me to repeat it, so I'm going to repeat it again. Jesus died because of our violent sinfulness. He didn't die because of a wrathful, violent father. Actually, if you want to get technical, he died a violent, wrathful death from a fallen demigod called man. Yet rather than calling thousands of angels to his defense, he held true to his identity as the son of a loving father who loves and forgives. And as a result, even death, mind you, that comes from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, could not hold him. The challenge is, are we willing to be humble enough to let that reality be revealed in us rather than siding with the causes of the scarlet harlot and her beasts? The metaphor of the millstone, if you remember, it said that it, she was going to have a millstone put around her neck and thrown into the ocean. Remember that? So what is interesting is millstone is the word rakav in Hebrew. Now, this relates to Mark 942, which says, but anyone that believes in me who would stumble one of these little bits. That's Aramaic, the Aramaic translating, calls kids little bits. But anyone that does, believes in me who would stumble one of these little bits, it is prudent for him if a millstone of an ass was laid down on his neck and cast in the sea. Now, just to, he wasn't calling somebody an ass. The millstone of an ass. Understand how the millstone worked as it was traveled. It was pulled by an ass, a donkey. Because, you know, we got to be proper language, right? right? But here's the key thing. The word rakav means chariot rider. The word millstone and rider of a chariot is the same word. Why is that important? Well... If you remember back, I'm sure everybody remembers back to part five in detail. If you remember back to part five, chapter four, the, the one called Come Up Here, we talked about the Ma'ase Merkava, the way of the chariot. Merkava is from the chariot. Rakav is there. That's the word. The issue was God's chariot, if you remember, was built on the David the number 24, which was love. Her chariot, if you will, the beast she rides, with the false lamb that spews the fiery dragon's words, what she rides is that legalistic right and wrong political system, all that stuff. And what happens is they, if you go back and read the text, they put the millstone around her neck and throw her, not God, they do it and throw her in the ocean. Why? Because that judgmental system eventually comes back on you. Judge not lest you be judged. Ouch, but true. So now they are riding her into the ocean. Because she was the opposite, and like any religious, moralistic, judgmental system, that which judges will eventually be ridden to destruction. Not because God is doing it, like killing babies. It's because of that system we have of reaping what we sow. That's this world system. Revelation 18.24 it ends with this verse, 
the blood of the prophets and the saints, and the very ones slaughtered in the scapegoat sacrificial system of the world order were evidenced in her. She produced the scapegoat sacrificial system, that penal substitution, vicarious atonement, you know, angry God, got to send the son, all this stuff, that whole teaching system. And how did the writer of Revelation know about it? Because it's been around, I can, believe me, in the, the new Melchizedek book, I take you through some of them. There, it's all there. And in my view, that was God trying to still communicate about the dying and rising God that would redeem in those systems. And then it says, in the fullness of time, God sent his son. So I'm not trying to condemn those systems except to say what surrounded those systems were penal substitution. Scapegoat mentality, which was no different at the time of Jesus and the Jewish mentality at that time was scapegoating. Go back and read the Gospel of John. Jesus was the scapegoat by Caiaphas. Thus we conclude part 17, chapter 18, and we'll get into chapter 19, where after this occurs, when the false church is brought to ruin, finally, there's great praises in heaven. Why have we gone this far? I mean, we're at chapter 19 now. Believe it or not, we only got a few chapters left, 20, 21, and 22, and we're done. That's nuts. <laughs> Can't believe we're that far. I remember starting this. I thought this was a daunting task. Still feel like it's a daunting task. But here's the point. Why, why is this? Because first of all, up until now, we thought Jesus was going to come back and beat them sinners up that didn't receive him because they're vile and wrong and immoral and all that stuff. But the one that's being destroyed first in line is a Christian religion. And that legalistic system became the cage that empowered the demonic forces. And what do we do? We empower the very thing we then say we're against. And by we get on this kind of little hamster wheel going in circles. Well, they want to silence the gospel. No, they want to silence the harlot. Years ago, I said this, and I'll close with this stuff. You know, there are folks that really made a tizzy fit on a particular presentation Madonna did with kind of a faux crucifixion of herself on a cross. And for lack of a better word, I'll say it this way, poked fun at that. Really wasn't. She was serious about what she was saying. It wasn't she was making fun like jest. The thing is, is when you watched it, Within the next two to three days, you start talking to pastor friends in the neighborhood or whatever, and all of a sudden, did you see that? That's what the devil's doing, knocking the cross. And I said, no, go back and listen to it. She's pointing out our hypocrisy. And when, when somebody that you may not agree with because of other quote, because you know how Christians are, I love them, but I don't agree with their lifestyle. Well, guess what? You don't have to agree with it. You only need to live your own life. The fact I don't agree with her lifestyle equals I have judged what she's doing is what is something wrong. I won't do it. Next slab. Point is, though, is how many times God has had to step outside the church to herald a message to us to, to try to get us out of the harlot before it all comes crashing down. Out of harlot thinking, mind you. That doesn't mean there's still going to be, and maybe there will be. So, you know, some folks are just, uh-uh, I'm, I'm going to believe in my legalisms, and, and I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Well, I hope not. Maybe in the new heaven and new earth, you get it right. But, of course, that's where Revelation 22 comes in, and 21, where we talk about new heaven and new earth and what that's all about. Give you a hint. Heaven's not forever. Can't be. 
if there's going to be a new one. Oh, he meant the sky. Nowhere else in the context of Revelation was he talking about clouds. Except as metaphor for spiritual meaning. That's for something else. Next time, part 18, chapter 19. I'll look at how the victorious exclamations are made and why in, in their context are they. And maybe we need to take that to heart. My prayer right now for us in the world of the church, whatever that's supposed to be, I guess people who claim this name of Jesus is that, Lord, we would really discover a humility, willing to face our own decisions, some of the things we've aligned ourselves with. And the only reason why we did is because, well, we use the old expression, well, it's just the lesser of two evils. Wrong tree. But that, Father, we'd become a church, a church world, a manifestation of the kingdom that heralds an entire otherworldly message. And Lord, I'd like to believe that even though this world is part of that right, wrong, good, and evil system, that as the gospel of grace begins to permeate it, even there'll be places within it that can become a lot nicer to live in. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Wow. Amen. Thank you, DJ. Um, and again, I'm going to echo what DJ said in the beginning. Um, hopefully you're listening to this. You're studying with us with a humble heart. If anything that was said made you go, ouch, there is time for you to, again, recenter the word of God in you and get back on the right path. Um, I mean, this is just, it's, it's a lot. Um, and thank you again for doing the study. Um, I always go back and rewatch it because I know the first time that I watch it, there's times that I, I go, Oh, he said that. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, as many times, as long as I've been in the church, um, I think it was the, one of the first or second times I was here that you read Colossians and I went, he nailed it to the cross. All of what I, I I'm just going to, yeah, all of what I, I had, was standing on as a, as a child, as a Christian, just went psh, out the window because I was holding and I, you know, it's, it, it baffles me how I was holding the commandments and grace on equal level. Um, and trying to live the right path following the commandments. And yet I was believing in grace. Okay. Um, it, like I'm just pe saying for me that that's where I was. So if you're there, there is still hope. There is still time. Like I said, to recenter yourself with the word of God. And if you have any questions, <laughs> please do, you know, send them, Text them in the comments, send them to Mastro Ministry. Um, read, go back and watch this again and study it again. And I'm sure it'll start making sense. It, 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 it will start the, the, when it's unveiled in your heart, then that knowing within your heart will be like, oh, wow, it's so much easier getting it here and letting it be unveiled into your into your life instead of trying to make it fit. You know, you cannot make a square peg fit in a round hole. All right. Amen. So <laughs> the word has already been preached. We say amen. Amen. <laughs> um, with that, um, please do. We accept all offerings. Um, uh, just bless the man of God that has, like I said, countless hours to go through and to check the Greek and the Hebrew and the, you know, and to, to make it line up, you know, or to reveal how it lines up. 
um, please do. If you're watching, um, please send it to Mastro uh, on the app. Send it, um, click Mastro Ministries. If you're going to send it through snail mail, <laughs> um, we welcome those too. Just put in your comment line on your check or money order, put Mastro Ministries. Amen. 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 Thank you. How wonderful you are. How can I tell you, Lord? How wonderful you are. Amen. Again, thank you for your donations. Thank you for joining us. We do hope that this has been a blessing to you um, as much as it has been a blessing to us. God bless you. Um, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for every hearer of the word, Father God, as well as for... <laughs> We just thank you for every hearer of the word. We thank you for the word that you have been revealing to us in our hearts and in our lives, Father God. We ask that you would continue to manifest yourself to us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a good evening. And how your love has made me free. How you gave so selflessly. And I wonder how can I begin to thank you for loving me. And my desire, Lord, my desire is to be with you.